All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight, and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Roman Mars and Kurt Colstead presenting their new book, The 99% Invisible City, A Field Guide to the Hidden World of Everyday Design. They're going to be talking with Seth Godin tonight, so you are in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Roman, Kurt, Seth, and the team at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. So we're not able to host events in our store spaces right now. Our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. So now just a couple little housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you, but they can see you're here and you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it, excuse me, by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The 99% Invisible City, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to be able to offer actual shopping in our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Monday, uh, sorry, Tuesday through Sunday. And you can purchase Roman and Kurt's book and many others on site or order online. You'll see the link in the chat shortly for a quick pickup of the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. If you care about supporting the careers of authors, if you love this book, and if you care about independent bookstores, buying the book is a great way to show your support. So some introductions. Our interviewer tonight is Seth Godin. He's the author of 19 books that have been bestsellers around the world and have been translated into more than 35 languages, including Lynchpin, Tribes, The Dip, and Purple Cow. His latest book, This Is Marketing, was an instant bestseller around the world. And his next book, The Practice, Shipping Creative Work, comes out in November. He's also the founder of the Alt MBA and the Akimbo Workshops, online seminars that have transformed the work of thousands of people. In addition to his writing and speaking, Seth has founded several companies, including Yo-Yo Dine and Squidoo. His podcast is in the top 1% of all podcasts nationwide, sorry, worldwide. And his blog, which you can literally find by typing Seth into Google, is one of the most popular in the world. He's going to be speaking tonight with our featured authors, Roman Mars and Kurt Colstead. Roman is the creator and host of 99% Invisible, the wildly popular podcast exploring architecture and design for which he produced the most successful crowdfunding campaigns for a podcast in Kickstarter history. Fast Company named Mars one of the 100 most creative people in 2013, and he was a TED main stage speaker in 2015. Kurt is the digital director and producer of 99% Invisible. Before joining the show, he founded a series of successful online magazines on cities and design, starting with Web Urbanist in 2007. He holds a graduate degree in architecture from the University of Washington's College of Built Environments. Their new book, The 99% Invisible City, zooms in on the various elements that make our cities work, exploring their origins and other fascinating stories behind everything from power grids and fire escapes to drinking fountains and street signs. So you're gonna hear lots more about the book and about the work that Kurt and Roman do, and they're gonna have a conversation with Seth and then open it up to questions from all of you. So Seth's gonna start us off, please take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Jessica, and to my hero, Roman, and to the wonderful scribe and uh, designer, Kurt. It's a privilege to be here with you. Stop typing in the chat for just one minute because I got an announcement to make. I have to explain Godin's first law of bookstore events. Here's what happened. My very first book, Business Rules of Thumb, 1986. It comes out from Warner Books. My editor was also working on Vanna White's book. He was very distracted. And so it was up to me to figure out how to make this book work. I used to play Ultimate Frisbee. And in the Westchester Ultimate Frisbee League, it's pretty brutal. And I really hurt my ankle. But I had a bookstore signing at a Barnes & Noble here in Westchester County outside of New York City. And I show up on crutches with a big swollen foot. And there's a big pile of books on the table. And I'm there to sign books. And here's what people did. They approached the table. They picked up the book. They looked at the front cover. They looked at the back cover and they put it down and they walked away. And here is the rule. The rule is if you approach the table, you have to buy the book <laughs> because <laughs> the author can see you. So if you look in the chat right this minute, there is a link bit.ly slash Rocky Rocky. We can tell how many of you are clicking on the link. We are watching you. 
right now, and we are going to be able to record how many people do it. So this is the book right here. It's beautiful. If you are wondering if you like 99% Invisible, you do, because that's why you're here. If you are wondering if this book is as good as the two of them say it is, that is why I am here. I am here to tell you just two phrases. And if these two phrases resonate with you, you're going to need to click on that link. Here's the first phrase. Infrastructural schadenfreude. If the phrase infrastructural schadenfreude feels like the sort of thing that you would like to see in a book, then I hope that you will click on this link. And you know what? We can't even tell if you're buying it. So just click on the link to make me feel better about this. And then you can get rid of Godin's rule of approaching the table. So we're going to have a far reaching conversation with my colleagues and heroes. I am so jealous of their skills, their chops, their genius. I will try not to show my jealousy. Um, hi, guys. How are you? Kurt, Roman, thank you for oh, being here. Hey, Seth. That's, that was the Great. most glorious intro <laughs> you've ever had. I forget to be in the presence of a marketing genius and business genius like yourself, what type of treatment you get when you show up at a place. <laughs> so there is not a shortage of 99% Invisible. You guys are up to how many hundred episodes? 416 went out. Right. So if you want to go listen to one of those episodes, just go. We are here because the book industry is different. Book yeah. people are desperate. We're desperate in the following ways. There are libraries. Think about that. The music industry would never stand for a building that buys one copy of a song and then lets anyone listen to it. Not only that, but we blurb each other's books, encouraging you to buy the products our competitors make. Tim Cook doesn't blurb Samsung phones because he has a scarcity mindset. We have an abundance mindset. So our goal here is to explain why even make a book and why do you need to own one? And Josh, I will try to talk quieter so that Roman's mic is matching mine. Well, anyway, to talk louder, man. I'll start with I'll start with Kurt. <laughs> why why do we why a book? Why not just one more episode of the show? Because over the years, and it's been like thirteen years that I've been writing about architecture, design, and cities, and you know, a decade since Roman's been working on the show, so that's a couple decades put together. We've researched a lot of stuff, and we've told some of those stories, but they're all kind of individually out there right like they're in these kind of serialized formats where you can sort of subscribe to an audio feed or a text feed but this is us taking like the best stories organizing them and putting them into this one format and to me like that that's like a i think of that as like a, a service <laughs> to the audience um so instead of having to wade through everything to find what you're looking for it's just kind of here and it's focused and it has a guiding principle and an arc to the thing that is bigger than just, oh, hey, we're gonna pull some of our, our best stuff and just kind of throw it together. And to me, even though it has an arc, like I would say that one of the things that I find interesting is that we have all this information over the course of you know 10 years um, locked into this linear format where I tell you, here's the start of the story, here is the end of the story and you have to follow it along there. And if you wanna remember, you know, like, Oh, um, uh, you know, like, what is that? Who's that person who was part of the rolling quads who created curb cuts? You have to go listen to the thing. And we've kind of broken that open into this thing that allows it to have this desire path. This is one of the metaphors we use in the beginning of the book, where you can sort of search through and find your way through all this information and the worldview of 99% Invisible. And it kind of just like trusts the audience to, um, you know, to take on all the things that we've been talking about for 10 years and explore them a little bit more at their own pace in their own way and mix and match. And I thought that was kind of a fun thing to do at this point. And I was also yeah, go ahead, Kurt. insistent that we have an index for this book. <laughs> I mean, I wanted this, I hate books without indexes. I really do. I, I mean, some, some books work better that way or work fine that way, but, but I want people to be able to find the thing that they remember reading about and find it easily. So like organization is a big driving thing for me in all of this. Yeah. So I, as a book person for 30 years, I, I've created 130, 140 books so far. Mm -hmm. um, I think you missed two key things in your answer. And I want to just elucidate them because maybe it, they just weren't top of mind. The Go first one is if you look behind me, there's a bookshelf. Mm -hmm. There is no equivalent of a bookshelf for podcasts. Agreed. And so yeah. I walk into this room 
And I remember where I was when I bought that book and where I read this book. And having this thing on my shelf is a way of me saying, oh yeah, that one about when they turn the river in Chicago green, and then I can go dive in. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that's really important because a lot of people have been trained, to, interesting statistic, the average American adult buys one book a year. And the reason is we have been trained to associate books with school and coercion and compliance, whereas we've been trained to associate friends and movies and TV shows with mindless, you know, whatever. Um, mm. And this book is designed not to be read from cover to cover. I think some people will, but it works beautifully if you read it backwards or one chapter at a time. And so I open this thing up, you know, approachable ducks. There's just like <laughs> approachable ducks. That's what the title of the book should be, first of all, approachable <laughs> ducks. So Kurt, what's an approachable duck? Um, and a, <laughs> we'll see. Okay, I have way too much fun with titles and subtitles, and I spent entirely too much time coming up with dumb puns and inside jokes, and Roman assured me that some people wouldn't get those, and the copy editor actually um, a couple times tried to change the name of a neighborhood of Barcelona back because it's spelled like example, but there's an extra I in it, and she was convinced I was just making a mistake, and I'm like, no, it's... It, it's meant to be that way. But what's an approachable <laughs> duck? An approachable duck is a kind of building. It's a kind of building that engages One of the two you. types of buildings. <laughs> One of two types of buildings. It's contrasted with a decorated shed. And a duck is a building that through its very form tells you what it is. And the name comes from a very specific building, which is shaped like a duck and where they sell eggs or did for a long time. It's gone. What kind of eggs? You know, I'm thinking about that and I'm like, did they sell duck eggs? They did sell duck eggs. They okay. did sell duck eggs. <laughs> Just they? checking. It's super yeah. extra weird. Um, so, yeah, so you look at the building and it's telling you, we sell eggs. Like, like it's just part of the building. And so it's one way in which you can differentiate types of buildings is to say, is it a duck or is it a decorated shed? And it always kind of coming at an era of, of architectural history when People were mostly, you know, into boring modernism and there were some reactionaries against this who went and studied Las Vegas of all places and tried to figure out, are there, are there lessons that we can learn right. from the architecture that people love? Like people love Vegas and it's, you know, it might not be the fancy thing that we think about when we think architecture, but people love it. And so we should study it. That's a great riff. Uh, I wanted to. I love that episode on Vegas too. By the way, I've listened to every one of the episodes <laughs> as far as I can tell. There was a point when I was getting ahead, and it was making me sad. Uh, I want to interrupt our riff here for a minute. Seventy-four clicks. That's close to a record. Our goal. There are two hundred thirty people on this call. Our goal is one hundred and fifteen clicks. So another fifty clicks, and we will enter the the world record territory of people who are not violating the "don't approach the table" rule. And the folks at Greenlight were super to bring us together. All right. So, Roman, in a previous conversation, I heard you talk about the fact that the, the germ of the show were four-minute riffs that you used to do. Can you talk us through how you went from four minutes on the radio to inventing the medium of our time? <laughs> Well, you know, so the, the idea originally was the, the AIA of San Francisco um, approached uh, KLW, a, a radio station I've had a long time relationship with, and, um, and said, well, what it would be like to do like a little two, four minute uh, piece about a local building um, in San Francisco. And I was like, that sounds great. Although I think that the more interesting thing was maybe like little elements in the city, like little bits of design. I think that would be more fun. And the first idea I came up with was curb cuts. It took us about uh, eight years to finally do that story. But I was convinced that there was like a, a bureaucratic rule as to the angle of a curb cut. And I thought telling someone that and having them in be interested in that would be a fun drop in in Morning Edition. That, for some reason, that was the thing that stuck in my head. And from there, I put it out. And then I had a friend, uh, Kevin Smokler, who's a brilliant guy. And I was putting it on the, on the radio and, then, and I also put it out on a website, like on a Tumblr, because I didn't want to maintain anything because I was busy. You know? <laughs> like, and so, um, and he just said, I'm not going to go to your Tumblr and listen to your show. 
just put it together in a podcast just so I can find it more easily. You don't, it doesn't have to be your job. Just do it. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And then what I found very quickly was that to make a four minute show, it's very hard to make a four minute show because making something I mean, like the, the, the old saying of like, please excuse the length of this letter. If I would have had more time, I would have made it shorter. You know, like um, it's, it's very true when it comes to, when it comes to radio is like, you're, you're really, it's really hard to make things short and good. And so I always found that I had like a, just something else I wanted to put into it. And so I began releasing on that podcast something that was six minutes long and then maybe 10 minutes long. And it was like this pressure release valve for how brutal I had to edit it for the radio. So, cause I could knew that there was another thing that could exist. I would be happy that it existed there and it would just let me let go of it so I could cut it down for radio. And then the audience of podcasting was really beginning to develop and we were developing a really big audience for such a new and small show. Um, and I say we, at this time, it was, uh, it was just, it was just me. <laughs> it was, I was just doing it like as my fourth job at night. And so, um, and so then it became, I began thinking of the podcast version as the, as the first version. Like it wasn't the second version that I was putting out there in the world. It wasn't the director's cut. It was the cut. And the radio version was the, was the derivative product. Yep. And, and, and that was, it was beginning to like, the, the, the form was beginning to dictate like what was, what was happening. And, and the, you know, like the, the, I guess the format was beginning to dictate the form. And that's, but that's the part I want to dig into because what it means to experiment with a new medium, which is my whole career, is mm -hmm. how do you make it in and of itself? Because you could have made four, you know, it could have been like hardcore history but you didn't. And it could have been, you know, a nine minute lightweight thing and you didn't. It became this thing that's not a riff on all things considered. It's not a riff on um, Ira Glass. It is in and of itself. And it's what a podcast at its best should be. But you sort of crafted it. Did you see it or did it just happen? I think it somewhat happened. And I think it, I think it happened because of various influences. Like I'm glad that I had an experience of making it short an experience of like really hardcore editing in my history inside of radio so that I had the discipline to not get it, let it get lazy or shaggy. Um, even though I had, I have more than the ability I could, you know, it can be four hours long, you know, but I, I still feel like th that I have that training there, which helped me a lot. Like I learned a lot from radio and I think that I took some of the best things from radio and I just shaved off some of the constraints of it. And, um, but learn the good lessons of what those constraints can give you and not the bad lessons of just, you know, like it just take, like I spent so much of my time as a public radio producer, um, stretching to fit a time or cutting to, to make a time. Yeah. And it was just, it felt just like wasted effort after a while. And now, you know, now every bit of that editorial energy is spent um, towards just making the thing better. You know, like it has nothing to do with, um, you know, with, with just hitting a time, it just has to do with quality. And I think that's why you, I think that's what you hear. In it. Yeah. And then, so Kurt did, when you shifted and said, there's a book here, I, I heard you talk about Stuart Brand is, do you have book heroes that you had in mind as you were trying to figure out like the book is whatever it is, um, uh, 350 pages long, which means 70, it's 75,000 words. Right. So it's less than 10 less. cents. Less than 10 cents a page, I'm just saying. Um, but it's not 700 pages and it's not 100 pages. So what is this package thing? Did the boundaries help you or did they drive you crazy? Oh, they were, they were great, actually. Um, my, although I will say when I, when I first heard the word count, I didn't know what 75,000 words meant. So I didn't know if that was a lot or a little. Um, and as uh, we started to sort of work on drafts and try to figure out like how many stories are going to be in this thing, it quickly became clear that the problem was not going to be filling up the book. The problem was going to be streamlining the book, which is a good problem to have, right? Like you, if you have more than you can use, that means you're going to edit things out and editing always makes things better. So uh, in the end, it was a good constraint to not let it get too long. And there were some, I mean, a couple of, you know, people keep asking, like, what are, what's your favorite story? And my favorite stories, a lot of them are ones that basically, like, the editor or Roman said, um, you know, maybe we should just cut that. So I had to think, okay, well, is this worth saving? And if yep. so, how do I save it? 
and to save it often meant really making it much, much better so that I could convince other people it, that's a story worth telling. And that can really help you get to the essence of a story too. Yeah. So I, it, in the end, I would say the constraints were helpful. And that's true for any designed object, like not just the book, but definitely was helpful for the book. I, I want to talk about uh, two things that are in the book and two things that aren't in the book. Um, but while we're talking, we're getting close to our Q&A time. Here's what I'd love you to do. If you have a question, there's a little button at the bottom that says Q&A. Try to ask a question that other people want the answer to. Those are the ones I'm going to pick to share with um, our guests here today. Uh, so with that said, I was at a, uh, a talk just a couple of days ago, and the person who was uh, hosting it was trying to sound smart, and he said, self-defecating instead of <laughs> self-deprecating. And I had to bite my tongue. But defecating has a lot to do with cities. Why is that? And how has that how does that show up in the book and in the way you think about the systemic approach of what even makes something a city? Oh, well, there man. you go. I mean, the big one that I can think of when it comes to defecating is the city of Chicago and reversing the river. So like there's a, there was a certain point in Chicago's history where, especially when they started becoming the meat packing, um, you know, capital of the world, um, when all of, it was all the animal you know, feces that was making it into the river that was like overwhelming the city. And if you know anything about, you know, rivers, rivers, you know, they kind of come from the ground or from the hills and then they go out to big bodies of water. And so that's the same case for the Chicago River. It empties out into Lake Michigan. And what was the problem was, uh, it was, that's where, Michi that's where Chicago gets its drinking water was from Lake Michigan. And it was being overwhelmed by by uh, animal shit <laughs> and so and so they were, had a problem and so what they started to do is they did a, they did a couple of things they were trying to like okay so why don't we um you know the intake for for fresh water it was right close to the shore and they sort of like took the intake way way out and they tried to see if that would work and it ended up it was still being it was still being caught and so they, they came up with this genius and very what seems like a foolhardy and hubristic idea they decided they were going to reverse the flow of a river and so they ended up digging through the end of the Chicago River and making it empty into a tributary to, to the Mississippi River and reverse the flow so that the flow of water went from Lake Michigan into the Mississippi River and most notably uh, right across um, St. Louis's uh, back door, um, which they tried, the St. Louis tried to stop them in the Supreme Court and they failed to stop them in time. And so this sort of thing was the type of thing that people thought they could take on at this period of time, which I do find, I, this is something that came up yesterday. It's like, there's something about uh, men in waistcoats and twirly mustaches who uh, take on these huge engineering projects 100 years ago, which I find charming, which I would find overwhelmingly alarming if they were happening today. <laughs> but um, but the thing is, is when it comes to cities, you know, we live in them and we create waste in them and we have to live together in them and putting those systems together and how to deal with them is a complicated mess. And that's one of the things I love about studying it. And, and one of the things I love about making the book is that, that it just tells us who, so much of who we are as humans to talk about that friction of us all trying to live together and solve those problems. Yeah. I mean, Kurt, and, you got one? Is it <laughs> raccoon related? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I could, I could definitely, but no, I, I mean, I, there's a couple, right? I mean, we talk about uh, manhole covers in Japan being used as a way to try to encourage people to get on board with municipal spending. So they'd make these artistic manhole covers to get people excited about sewers of all things, right? Which I think is just amazing. And then, you know, since we're in New York right now, virtually speaking. Um, this, this entry called Fish Stories comes to mind, which talks about how, you know, Manhattan was full of waterways. And the, you can still see reflections of that today. And there was this, um, this guy who wrote into the New York Times in the 1970s about fishing in an underground stream. And, and, about, and like, to this day, buildings have to like pump water out of the ground. And it's like, we kind of came along and just laid cities out on top of water and then later have had to try to figure out how to deal with both, you know, water that we're going to drink and wastewater that we have to get rid of. 
And that retrofitting process has taken a lot of forms and been a real challenge in like the evolution of cities as they've gotten bigger and bigger. Yeah, I live uh, 50 feet from the aqueduct that brings, that used to bring all the water to New York City. And if they hadn't built that, there would be no New York City. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, sure. and then, then the second theme, which I can't recall you talking about directly, so I would love to hear you expound on it. It's in the book through and through. You use the word design two different ways. You use it to mean that a human or a group of humans got together and designed a thing. But then you're also talking about this organic effect that happens Wikipedia style where anyone can edit it. And so when I think about cities, when I think about the magic of this book, we're up to 120 clicks, by the way, <laughs> this is a new record. When I think about this book, it's all about the fact that anyone can edit a city. Mm -hmm. And share a favorite riff about that. Well, I think that I, that's kind of what chapter six is kind of all about is this is we, we sort of guide you through the book of all these different ways to look at cities, the invisible part, the things that are conspicuous, but trying to be invisible, things that are inconspicuous and you don't notice all this sort of the different modes of it. And then we come to this point that like once you understand all these different design elements of a city, then we bring you to the concept of like, well, what a city really is is this conversation between top-down designers and bottom-up interventionists. And that conversation is where all the good stuff happens. And so we have these, these, um, you know, these, these, these different examples of people you know, taking it upon themselves to change the city as they see fit. And I don't think it's like because city designers are you know, bad people, evil totalitarians or whatever. It's just that no human being can anticipate the uses of a city that every human being might need it. And so we like, we like, we edit around the edges to make it as we need it to be. And that can be anything from, you know, like being on your street and recognizing that, you know, parking signs that tell you when and you can and can't park are almost indecipherable. Like, and it's sort of, that's a, almost a universal rule. They have to convey so much information in words that are just so hard to parse that there have been designers in many instances um, around the globe, but most notably, I can't remember her name right now in, in Los Angeles, who, yeah. who, who, um, who just made them better, you know, like, and then made them so much better that the city took notice and began to sort of think about how to adopt this type of signage in their own signs. And, um, and it, takes, it takes the initiative of a person to go act on something to realize it can be changed, which is, I think, part of what the book is trying to empower you to do. But also, it takes the open-mindedness of the sort of the powers that be to, to accept some of those things. And we've seen both, honestly, like th this is a good conversation that I think really thoughtful people are having. And even though they're at odds sometimes, they usually come to some kind of accord, which well, is pretty enjoyable. Yeah, and one of my favorite examples of that is a pretty short story in the book about New York City fire hydrants and how, you know, the first case of somebody opening those during a hot summer it was Theodore Roosevelt was doing this as the police commissioner. And so it was this official act, right? Like this was a sanctioned thing to help cool people down. And then people started doing it illegally in the summers that followed. And so there was this kind of back and forth between like, well, is it sanctioned? Is it not? And there were concerns that you know, people get hurt getting knocked over by the, by the spray. There was a lot of wasted water. And eventually the city came up with this kind of hybrid solution. They said, well, we're gonna give you caps. So these caps are gonna slow the water flow. Um, so you can open hydrants, but just do it safely and do it so it doesn't waste water. And, and to me, that's like the perfect thing, right? It's like, it, it's top down, it's bottom up, there's a conversation and out of it comes this better solution that enables people to you know, enjoy their city more. Love that, that's great. Okay, so now the two things I wanna bring up that aren't in the book, given how good the index must be because Kurt approved it. <laughs> the first one is skewmorphs. I think we don't spend nearly enough time talking about skewmorphs. This is what Zoom would look like if it was based on skewmorphs. <laughs> so the question is pro or con and how do they relate to uh, cities or why aren't they in the book? Well, 
I mean, I think most, most notably skeuomorphs tend to be the digital representation of a previous physical thing. And since mostly we're dealing with physical things, there's not a much need for like a skeuomorphic representation of these things. I'm trying to think there's something that does exist like this. And so I'm gonna give, I'm gonna talk a little bit more to give Kurt, uh, he has a much more of an index brain for these types of things. So maybe he'll think of one as I'm talking. Um, but that's, that's generally it. And so, so one of the things about the show, the show is about all kinds of design in all kinds of ways. It can be about Ouija boards and the design of government and signs of flags and stuff like this. We definitely wanted, this is not, the book is not a representation of the whole of the show. It's really is the idea is that it was a field guide to a city and therefore it was built around objects. And since those objects, they don't have digital representations of themselves. In general, do, how do I feel about skewomorphs? I feel that there, there was a period of, of hatred of skeuomorphs and a love and embrace of flat design that, that, you, that the only way to be a true digital designer was to flatten everything and make it you know, custom made for the, for the thing that it is. And, and hearkening back to physical things was a, is, a, is a terrible idea. I think that that kind of puritanism is a bad thing in design. I think that there are certain good things about skeuomorphs that they remind you of how to use things and, um, and, it, and it is, if, it's, if it's useful to me, I'm just like empirically like, if it's useful, it's great. You know, like, like I am not, there's a reason why we tell design stories on the radio is I don't get hung up with the aesthetics of design as nearly as much as other people do. And so to me, a, a good skeuomorph is totally fine. There's, there's definitely bad ones. Like the, er, the first like um, a podcast app from, from Apple had a reel to reel machine, which is a that's, a, that's almost insane. You know what I mean? Like that's, that, that's a skeuomorph that is like barely relates to me, you know, and I'm 46 years old. You know? So, so, um, so, but, but in general, like, I'm, I'm like, yeah, it's case by case, almost like everything. All right. Yeah. That works. Kurt, you want to add anything before I get to my last one? No, go for it. Go for it. Okay. That was a great answer. So I would also love to hear you riff about noted megalomaniac and uh, acknowledged racist, power-hungry Robert Moses. Oh, man. Oh, interesting. He does come up in the book. Um, he does. Not a huge I, amount. Yeah, but go no, ahead. No, but we definitely, um, we, we threw in a few adjectives that made it clear how we, how we felt about him. Um, we didn't go into great detail. We didn't give him a lot of page space. I mean, one of the most notable stories, which is not in the book, um, and partly because I couldn't fully verify if this was apocryphal or not, is supposedly he built, he got the bridges in New York between the people and the beach to be built at such a height that buses could not make it to the beach, which was a way of pre preventing not just public transportation, but non-white people from getting to the beach, right? Yeah. So, so, I mean, he, he, I think the reason we, you know, we touch on Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses, two very pivotal figures in the history of urban design um, in the book. Uh, but I think we also, I mean, I just hear and know so much about them already. I feel like, I mean, there are entire books, really good books on, on, on those characters. <laughs> And so I didn't want to overdo it. Um, I, I think, I mean, that's kind of my, I don't know, that's my short answer. Yeah, I mean, my take is if you're, gonna, if, if you're going to talk about cities as conversations, besides uh, his uh, racism, Moses refused to have a conversation. Exactly. That's really what it was. I mean, he was offended by the concept of a conversation. Yeah. And, and that's what you get the most from the biography of him that's, that Robert Caro wrote is that this is a person that hated to be questioned in any kind of way and really saw himself so much of the hero of his own story that um, you know he just refused to, to hear anything otherwise. And he was totally not the hero of New York. But I do think that there's something about, um, if embodied in a different person, <laughs> A, somebody who has the will and the ability to create things on the scale that he did is, is something that I think sometimes some cities are missing. And, well, and yeah. So I mean, that's the one thing I would say about it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've always, I always think of this example of, so I'm from Minnesota and we, we elected, 
I say we very loosely. We elected Jesse Ventura uh, mm-hmm. at one point, which was strange. And uh, and his politics don't all align with mine on a lot of levels, but he strong armed a certain amount of public transit advancement that others didn't seem to be able to get done. He just said, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this. So I, I think that's, as Roman yeah. was saying, it's like, if, <laughs> if you've got this kind of strong man personality, but you're doing something good with it, then maybe there's some merit there, <laughs> but it really depends on what you're doing. You know, but that's, just, where the, that's where the tension is, is that it's unlikely that a fabulous idea is adopted on its own merits that there's heroism involved in all of the stories that are throughout the book. Heroism sometimes in a negative way or a positive way, because if it was in the manual and it was obvious, it would all be, it would be done, right? Mm-hmm. It's who's going to move it forward. So with that, we're going to segue into some questions. The first one I'm going to do is from Duncan Jackson. Do you have any takes on whether the 21st century has a Buckminster Fuller? And if so, who it might be? And it- Buckminster Fuller is a really hard one to fill, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. Like, there's just the, the nature of that type of polymath is like, the world is almost like so specialized and divided. I have a hard time imagining what the modern Buckminster Fuller is, personally. But that's a tough one. <laughs> what do you, I, do you I have think, any, Kurt? I know who's trying to be. Yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) But we're not going to even mention that person's name. So we will, we just will, but everybody knows who I'm talking about. But no, I I think one, what Roman said is true. And two, some of this is always only obvious in hindsight, right? Like, Mm -hmm. like we, like Frank Lloyd Wright was kind of a nobody for a long time. Buckminster Fuller, you know, it took some time for his ideas to gain traction. Um, I think a lot of this just isn't obvious yet. And that's just the nature of, history. Yeah. All right, so Br- Brad has a great question here about sunk costs, which is um, if you put a lot of effort into a story um, and then you have to kill it, the questions are, uh, how do you deal with that? Is it easier to kill a story you didn't put a lot of effort into? And number two is, can you share one with us that you wished you could have saved? Um, it is definitely harder to kill a story that you put a lot of effort into. I do think that the, um, what I always say about the, a show, like a, a healthy production has a number, like a, a habit of killing things, at least enough. You know, like it's hard to know which is, what is enough, but it's important. If you're never killing anything, it's probably the sign that you're a too stre- stretched to do a good job all the time. Cause you need a little bit of room to kill things. And, um, and it means you're not editing yourself like thoroughly enough because some things just uh, can't be saved and, it, and it's good to know that. Um, it's been a little while for us. We've been kind of stressed because of our, you know, like disparate locations in COVID. It's been, it's been kind of tough to, to kill things, but I do remember there was like a phase and most of the time we kill things, it's like, it's, it's that um, we, were doing, um, we were doing something that was kind of a what we thought was kind of a cool story about radioactivity in um, on Treasure Island, which is a, a, a man-made island in the bay, and um, and and you could map out the the use of different places, like where houses were and where parks were, based on where they used to just dump nuclear or like test nuclear material. And so, and basically like, they don't put that on house, you know, they don't put houses on that, but they do put parks on that. They put about a foot of ground on it and then they make it a park. And we thought it was like the, the way that the military shaped the Bay area was like a really interesting thing to us because the military just sort of like, like lands on a place, owns it for a while, lets it go. And if it wasn't for them being there and kind of destroying the environment, we wouldn't have parks, (laughs) you know, like it's kind of a weird side effect of that. And so I was kind of fascinated by this, but the problem was, um, especially when it came to the radioactivity on Treasure Island, a lot of people were, um, you know, uh, made a lot of claims of getting sick, you know, from that. And it was impossible for us to investigate it, like, and to do it responsibly and take their story and like be fair because, um, 
I, I was extremely sympathetic and I was always siding with them, but there wasn't, um, there wasn't always a scientific backing for it. And I thought we were kind of undermining them. And it just was a kind of a mess. And, and it was like, we thought we were going to do this fun story about the fact that the military was um, created our parks in this inadvertent way by destroying the environment. And then it ended up being this human story of people being sick and, and we didn't know how to verify it. We didn't know how to fact check it. It was really, really hard. And it realized that like our tone and the subject didn't match anymore. And that was one of the latest ones we ever killed. Cause it, it was just like, we realized our approach in the beginning was wrong. And, and that was, so that's the type of thing that ends up happening. It's just like something kind of gets away from us and the story is not the story. And we realize we can't cover it responsibly. That's, that's kind of the, the hard ones. Yeah. And a very short, um, a very short addendum to that is like just not having the right people to talk to you. If, if there's a key person and you need to talk to that person in order for the story to work and that person won't talk to you for whatever reason, that's just, sometimes it's just, that's what ends the story. And like, I was looking to maybe go longer with a story recently and I started asking and none of the people wanted to talk about it for various reasons. And I was just like, well, the, then there's no story, right? Or at least, you know, now I'll turn it into a little blurb on the website, but, but I can't, if I can't get the people to talk to me, then, then there's, yeah, there's no way to make an episode out of that. Super true. Yeah. I mean, that happens. That happens actually quite a bit, but usually that happens kind of early in the process. And yeah. so the, those are not as painful to me personally. So. Yeah. Okay. Super fast speed round because you guys have a tribe of uh, a true believers and I owe them some attention. First, Kurt, it's very clear from the book. Did I mention that there's a book? that uh, you pay a lot of attention to detail and someone wants to know that bookshelf behind you. Did it take a, did it take a long time to come out as beautifully organically as it did? Oh, I wouldn't say there's anything organic about it. It was definitely a, a designed arrangement. Um, it took a little bit of time. Uh, my, my partner actually helped uh, procure some of the, what's holding up the coins up there are actually like ring holders for like like finger rings that have been repurposed because that was all we could find at a craft store. Um, the book is propped open to a page that is not coincidentally a story about New York. Um, you know, the raccoon's obviously not an accident. And of course, um, if anybody here is a fan of Seth Meyers, they might notice a copy of The Thorn Birds I up did. on the shelf, a little, <laughs> little nod in that direction. So yeah, it took, there was, I definitely paid attention to what went up there. Well done. And then the audio geeks want to know why Roman Mars is wearing four headphones, two in each. <laughs> uh, one is uh, going to the Zoom, and one is going to my my monitor and recording the audio separately. So I had a feeling. I had a feeling. Okay. So the next riff, I am forty thousand dollars in to Challenge Coins because of that episode. Yeah. Um, do you hear from people uh, still about how? you shifted the culture of community by teaching everyone about that? Is, do you think that that was a, a, a singular moment in pop culture for you? I think so. It's hard to say because I think it had, I think it, enough of it was out there sort of simmering below the surface in a, a subculture that is barely a subculture in the military and in cops and firemen. So there's enough people out there to like be ready for it. But I think when, when I was asking about it and then Avery did the, the ultimately did the story, um, it, was, uh, it was just kind of like a thing that they kind of didn't even know because it was so, you know, like part of their own military culture. And so I do think that we kind of like, were, were, was this that little speck of dust to, you know, like all of a sudden it caught and like crystallized into something that, that people then like know about it and it went further because I definitely see them like I never heard about him in pop culture before the moment yeah. we covered it. And now it's like, there's, there's, I hear a story about it um, pretty regularly, like a, a, like a tasteless one done by a cops somewhere or a Trump one or something like this. And I feel like, you know, I feel like we might've been involved in that, whether or not we were the, the direct thing people heard to, to do it. It's just something about it. I think we got the ball rolling. And I've heard of, from a bunch of people like yourself, who, who when, I, when I met you and you, you shook a coin into my hand, uh, in New York, like five or six years ago, you, you, um, you were like, I, I learned this from you. And then, and so in my, uh, my friend, uh, Jason Reitman, the, the director, um, I recently was in his, his, his version of uh, the princess bride that we did for charity that was on. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, he, he makes coins for all of his productions. This is a six fingered 
man coin from um, Princess from, Bride. Yeah. from Princess Bride, and um, and he says like I do this for all my productions, and it's because of your show. So you know, so yeah, I think we have a little bit to do with that. So speaking of challenge coins, Jessica's going to help us out here. We think we can pull this off. There's no refunds if it fails. <laughs> The next person who buys a copy of the book at the link I just posted in the chat, we yeah. will do our best to send you a limited edition. There are none left. Challenge coin from the new book. Kurt, tell us what's on the challenge coin. Oh, the challenge coin is full of, full of joy and wonder. Now, first, we have the cover, which has pick points on the side because it's a manhole cover. It's where you leverage and get the, you know, get the cover off. Also has an anti-slip grid that's very important so you don't slip on it in the rain. On the back side, we have a cistern, cistern cover, which you can, yeah, I'm trying to get it in the right spot. So that circle represents a, an underwater cistern that's used to fight fires. There's a number of people walking across the crosswalk and oh, what's that? It's the front side of the coin in miniature on the back. And then of course, the very first story in the book is represented around the edges, which is all these utility codes, which tell you what is going on underneath the sidewalks and streets you walk across every day. Don't cross the streams. Okay, <laughs> so Nick asks, what's your favorite New York City bridge? I mean, I think I gotta say the Brooklyn Bridge. I, I think so. I mean, it's like- So many people died building it? Well, yeah, I think that's the reason why it's, I hold a special place in my heart. But like, but you know, like, but, um, um, caissons were invented for it and um like we learned what the bends were because of it and you know it is just this marvel and then um uh and and the fact that it was uh, i think it, it, the unheralded sort of creator of it um uh, roebling uh, i can't remember her first name but like yeah um the the engineer designer like he had a horrific i think stroke or something and his wife basically finished the bridge and I'm always, just, yeah Emily uh, Roebling, yeah. And so um, that is a sort of like an untold story that I've always kind of wanted to, to tell. Um, and and I, I think it's just sort of, and, and, and I just love, it's a, of that moment where there, you know, these were two cities, you know, like we don't think about Brooklyn as being a separate city, but they were two competing cities and they were joined together by this piece of infrastructure to basically become one city and then eventually become the, the, like boroughs in, in one city. And that's kind of a stunning thing for, for a, you know, a pile of stones, you know? Yeah. Kurt, you got a bridge? My, my favorite bridge is probably the bridge that somebody built right next to the Brooklyn Bridge that's about, that was about, I don't know, five feet across. <laughs> Roman knows what I'm talking about. Um, so at one point, the Brooklyn Bridge was sort of leaking, like it was, wasn't draining right. And so there's this puddle that was just kind of constantly there whenever it rained. And so some guy just decided to build this like little wooden bridge that just crossed a puddle basically. Um, and, you know, first of all, it was helpful, right? Like it, it got people across the puddle, that was nice. And then it of course raised awareness about this little glitch that was going on with the Brooklyn Bridge. And in the end they fixed, you know, they fixed the bridge. And to me, that's just like a great example of like, that. like a little thing that could make a big difference. I love that. For me, um, it's the 59th Street Bridge, not because, and the, sorry, the Willis Avenue Bridge, not because it's a good bridge, it's a horrible bridge, but because uh, I grew up in Buffalo, but my whole family was from here. And so as a kid, we would visit twice a year by driving the eight hours. And when we went from Northern Westchester into the city, we always took that bridge because you didn't have to pay the 10 cent toll. Mm -hmm. And my mom was an extraordinary human and I miss her every day. But thinking that we took a detour every single day <laughs> that we went to New York to save 10 <laughs> cents. It's a All right, so as we start to wrap this up, we got a great question here from Kaylin, which is, do either of you have any insights about what's gonna happen? Uh, you know, we know that mass transit is endangered by people not wanting to be in a space together for now, but as we enter a post COVID world, um, with vaccines and without vaccines, what shift do you think we're going to see and what can we learn from a hundred years ago that might be worth mentioning? Well, I don't know for sure. So, so the one I think, the, the one piece of public transit that I, uh, I'm curious to watch is the elevator. That's the one I'm actually sort of interested in because 
how we're going to pack inside of elevators and, you know, will buildings be tall, less tall maybe because high levels might be, because we went through this before, like the top level of a, of a building was the worst level of a building because no one wanted to climb stairs. And so rich people loved the bottom. And it wasn't until the Otis uh, company invented self-breaking elevators to make elevators safe enough that they began to sell the top floor as the ideal floor of a, of a building. And I do wonder if like the ideal floor will now be, A, will buildings be shorter? And, and, and B, will the ideal floor be the one that you do not have to ride an elevator to get on? And I, I'm curious to know if that, if that happens. Not, not because of this pandemic. I think this one will kind of pass and maybe we'll forget about it. But as, if we do have more of them as a regular basis and they're part of our lives, um, I wonder if that will happen. And I, I mean, I wonder, I wonder about mask use. Like I've, I've traveled to, to other, a, a lot of other countries and in some of those countries, more people than not on public transit were wearing masks. And, you know, it was just the culture there. And I, and I, I thought, I confess, I was young. I thought that's strange and I didn't really think much more about it. And now I'm like, yeah, maybe that was a good idea all along. And maybe that's just something that we'll do going forward. And maybe that's okay. Like maybe it seems like a big shift, but it's really not that hard to wear a mask. And maybe that'll become part of the culture. I don't know. Okay, so we've got one last round. If you've got a question, please answer it. I ask it. I know that I have not picked most of them. Sorry about that. Trav, who bought a book early on, we're going to let you have a question. Uh, Trav would like each of you to chime in on your favorite science fiction book, if you don't mind. Oh, this is I, I, This is my, this hard is my bag. This is my bag. And, I, and I'm still going to have a tough time answering it. I mean, like there's classics like Neuromancer. I am so into the expanse right now. Like you wouldn't believe it's space opera done right. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever read anything quite like it. Yeah. Um, but my, my, <laughs> my sci-fi list is long. Um, Seven Eves. Uh, by, uh, really? Yeah. You made yeah. it all the way to the end. It is. Well, it's like, it is. It's like a series of books. Honestly, it's like, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's huge. But Obama put it on his reading list. I, I was, yeah, but that's I, just because like, he can't, knew. Can't, can't. That's just because he knew no one finished it. So <laughs> I don't know. I, it you, is the best part. Like the end is where it all comes back together. But I mean, yes, it's a slog to get there. And a lot of his books, they take a while to get through. Yeah, Neil, like, Neil almost punched me in the nose because I said to him, <laughs> I said, Zodiac, Snow Crash, the, the Diamond Age. I said, did your editor retire after that? Because, like, no <laughs> one told him to stop. Clear, clean. Like, I mean, it, that was a really compact book. But, yeah, yeah so then it just started to kind of blow outwards. And I, I love it. Like, I just, I'm along for the ride. Uh, I'm okay that there are detours. Like, I, I just, I like his style, but. But it's not for everybody, probably. It's not. So I just got a quick. There's Isaac Asimov. I worked with him, um, oh, and I worked too. and I worked with Michael Crichton, and I worked with Ray Bradbury. Um, science fiction authors are the best. They're just because they have such small expectations. They're, they're not prima donnas. They they would like to be, but they can't get away with it because okay. they're just like they can they can just keep typing, doing you yeah, know, keeps going. All right. So Roman, uh, as we start to wrap this up, Marshall McLuhan. Medium is the message, et cetera. Mm -hmm. As this medium has changed, as it's reaching more people, as you know, we're finally beginning to get search to work in podcasts, have any of the shifts in the medium caused you to shift how you envision where this show goes? Well, I mean, the first one was, uh, actually it was Serial that changed. I thought that almost always that a, a podcast was an ongoing story that never ended. And I just was, that was the nature of what the, the, it meant to me. That's what an RSS feed said to me. Right. And, um, and so when somebody put out there and made something popular and good enough that it, you had to go with episode one and end with episode eight and that was the end of it, I was, I was actually kind of shocked. What they didn't do is they didn't solve the problem of how to, how to have that thing make money even though that's one of the most popular shows that's ever existed. Right. Um, no matter what, if you don't put out a show regularly and, and you have ads on your show, you, you, you can't really make a living on it. And so we haven't quite figured out how to make that all work, you know, and maybe it's, you know, a different kind of economic uh, like principle set on top of that thing. 
But um, that was the thing that first changed and, and made me think like, oh yeah, you can do this thing in a kind of order. And, um, and it, it's fun to experiment. The other one I'm, I think I'm interested in is because we can deliver a selected product, like because of the ad technology, we have this dynamic insertion. There's a way to present different stories to different people depending on where they are. And that's something that I think would be fun to play with. And that's something you can't do um, in a sort of mass communication before this moment. And that, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Yeah, it, all this is going to change the golden age um, because you're gonna end up with the Joe Rogans accomplishing potfuls of money. And then there's gonna be this long tail plus technology. Mm -hmm. And so you were able to, the curve was ahead of how many employees you needed. But it's going to get, it's, you're going to need 100 people to do in, the kind of dynamic different stories for different people kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah. it's going to be a real challenge. It, it, it is. I mean, I, I feel very blessed that I did it. I started when I did because it, it's so much harder to launch a show today than it was 10 years ago. I mean, it was hard then too, but there's just something about just hitting the critical mass of, of people interested in podcasting that we carried forward. Um, and so I'm, I feel very, really, really lucky. But like if, but today the type of, you know, we have uh, 13 people on staff to do the show now. Um, it, I could create, and I do this other show called What Trump Can Teach Us About Calm Law that's made with three people. And it takes uh, basically two days <laughs> to, to make. I would just make five of those, you know, to equal the amount of downloads we have in one 99 BI if I was bottom line right. um, today. And so um, you really have to fight to keep the type of quality that we have and, and, and try to make it scale. And, and hopefully the way that we're going to do it is we're going to chew at the 70% of people that don't download podcasts. I mean, that's still, there's still a rich market of people that have no idea about this great thing that exists that is the companion to me like almost all the time. And so hopefully we can, we can grab some of those people and bring them in. Yeah. Beautiful. It Kurt. was only the quality of 99% Invisible that got me listening to podcasts. So just yeah. I mean, that in Mystery Show Episode 3, that was it. Um, <laughs> so, Kurt, you had help making this book. As we wrap this up before we bring Jessica back on, you want to give a shout out to some of the people who designed, illustrated, et cetera. Anyone make a big difference? Uh, yeah. And the, list is, the list is long and it's in the back, but um, Raphael Gironi, Patrick Vale. I mean, our, I mean, our editor was great. Our fact checker was great. I want people to go. I want people to go read the acknowledgments because we put a lot of people in there, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I can't name them all. Who who else should I throw in there, Roman? Well, I mean, you know, Jay sold the book like it like it was oh, the, yeah. you know, the hottest book in the world to, to publishers. I, I took eighteen meetings in two days because of Jay Mandel. Kate Napolitano edited it like crazy. Um, Patrick Vale just like have if like we could not exist we could not like have designed a, a, an illustrator in a test tube more perfect for this material than Patrick Vale and then Raphael Gironi did things with type and 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 style and setup that I would have never I would have never thought would work like I would have never have told him to do this with all the different the different type and how they fit together but it does and that's one of those things that's just like I, I've done this long enough to know what I don't know and, and, just the, and just react. And my biggest problem with this one is because I was so new to the idea of books in general that um, every time I was just like, I'm delighted. You know, like, like I, I didn't have the same editorial like rigor that I do with the podcast um, because I was just like every, every part of it was like an amazing magic trip to me. And so, um, so yeah, we were, we, were, we were really blessed with our, you know, with our collaborators for sure. Okay, thank you both. One of the best parts about books is they give shy people a chance to talk about themselves because they feel <laughs> like they have to. And so I was thrilled, Roman, when you asked me if I would be your interlocutor. I will do it anytime. Oh, and yes. Jessica, you want to come join us and, and bring it on in? Yes, thank you guys so much for a fantastic conversation. I, this is what it's like to hang out with you in the audio and video, video space, and we really, really appreciate you. Um, I want to announce the winner of the challenge coin is the first person who bought the book after the announcement is Carol Neffinger, who I think is here, living in Burien, Washington. So I'll send along Carol's address, and you can send along the coin. And I have a couple others. So like, who is the first person to do it in the hour? I'll send one to that one too, like to that person too. 
I will look that up for you, you look and it let up. you know. Like, we'll, yeah. we'll find it. And you, <laughs> we'll, you contact we'll let them, them know. and I'll let them know. Because that for sure. I think the first person who stepped up to the table at Seth's uh, goading to not you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, is it, is it, is a, is a person who deserves one too. So I have a couple in my private collection and I'll send one to them too. Absolutely. We'll, we'll make sure everybody gets rewards. Thank you guys so much again for doing this. Thanks everyone for being here. You can see the link in the chat to buy not only this book, but Seth Godin's books also and support Greenlight as a local independent bookstore. So we appreciate all of you guys so much and hope that you have a great night. Keep making a ruckus, everybody. Love the book. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.